You are listening to Lighthearted, the official podcast of the United States Lighthouse Society. My name is Jeremy Dontremont. Welcome. My co-host today is Michelle Jewell Shaw, chairperson of Friends of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouses. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Jeremy, and hello to all of our listeners out there. Today is July 16th, 2023, and this is episode 234 of Lighthearted. Today, we'll listen to a conversation I had with Sally Montgomery, who has done some fascinating research on a historic lighthouse lens that's on display in Belfast, Northern Ireland. And in a minute, we'll also hear a short interview with Shannon Culpepper, who is the curator at an art gallery in Southern Maine that's having special lighthouse events this month. Before we hear that, uh, let's talk about a few of the other lighthouse events that are coming up, Michelle. Sure, Jeremy. Montauk Lighthouse in New York has several events this summer, including a lighthouse weekend on August 5th and 6th. The event will celebrate recent restoration work and will feature the Kings of the Coast Pirates in a reenactment of the 3rd New York Regiment from the American Revolution. Check out MontaukHistoricalSociety.org for details. I was just in Montauk recently. It's a, it's a great lighthouse, great place. At the Vermilion Lighthouse on Lake Erie in Ohio, there's a series of Sunday evening concerts called Live at the Lighthouse. On July 23rd, the Islands Songs Trio will be featured with songs about islands, sunshine, and enjoying the good life by the water. Sounds good. See Discover Vermilion, that's discover, V-E-R-M-I-L-I-O-N dot org, and click on events for more information. The Michigan Lighthouse Festival is coming up August 4th through the 6th. The festival includes lighthouse tours, cruises, guest speakers, and more. Go to michiganlighthousefestival.com for all the details. And I also want to mention that one of our favorite organizations, Friends of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouses, is having a sunset photography cruise on Friday, July 28th. There will be a special guest aboard. Photographer Mike Leonard, who listeners will, of course, remember, he's been on this podcast a few times. I will also be doing some narration. The cruise will go from Rye, New Hampshire, to the Isles of Shoals and White Island Lighthouse. All the details are at PortsmouthHarborLighthouse.org. So, Michelle, please help me introduce our first guest. Sure, Jeremy. Focus 244 is a new photography gallery in York, Maine. This month, the gallery is hosting a lighthouse festival featuring an artist's reception on July 22nd, kids' activities on July 23rd, and an evening presentation on July 23rd. That's right. And guess who the presenter is at that evening presentation? Is it you by any chance? Well, how did you guess? (laughs) Yes, it will be me. And I will be speaking about the lighthouses of New Hampshire and Southern Maine. Shannon Culpepper is the curator of the Focus 244 Gallery, and I had a chance to talk with her the other day about the Lighthouse activities this month. So let's listen to my conversation with Shannon now. I'm speaking today with Shannon Culpepper, who is the curator for Focus 244 Gallery in York, Maine. Thank you so much for being with me today, Shannon. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. You're very welcome. Clarify something for me. As I understand it, uh, the photographer Corey Kane is the owner of the 244, Focus 244 Gallery, and you're the curator. Do I have that right? So yes, he is the owner, and he invited my son and myself and a couple other artists to hang on the walls. And then I decided Mm -hmm. to come up with the community gallery where I have these stands where I invite other artists each month to come in. And this month it's Lighthouses. Yes. Yeah. We're going to talk about that. Uh, How long has the gallery been open? It's been open a little over a year now. Okay. So what led to this gallery being open? Were you involved in the actual process of an opening or did did, was that completely Corey? That was completely Corey. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, how did he come to open a gallery in New York? He had had been involved with it with another artist. And then that artist decided to close it and offered it to him to take over. And Corey said, Mm -hmm. sure. And he has a huge selection of York uh, lighthouse photography. So he thought he was just perfect for a tourist season mm-hmm. to have his gallery there. Yeah. And Corey does amazing photography. I was looking at his website. He largely Incredible. does wildlife, right? No, he does mostly landscape mostly and, landscapes. and lighthouses. Um, he does a lot. Every day he goes out and shoots a lot of wildlife and he posts the stories, but he his big uh, push is all lighthouses and landscape. Mm-hmm. Well, it all looks really beautiful. 
And uh, what I, it's probably a broad range of work, this feature there with the different photographers. And of course, this month, the big theme is lighthouses. Who are some of the other photographers and what kind of work do they do that's in the gallery? So you have Corey Kane, and then you have my son, Martin Culpepper, who's a 20-year mm -hmm. wildlife photographer, and he's going to be famous someday. He's also a public speaker for, for Hunt's photo, and he's got some beautiful acrylic wildlife shots there. Mm -hmm. And then you have myself, and I'm a fine art black, black and white artist, and I do mostly like landscape and wildlife together, kind of like a small mm -hmm. brain wildlife. And then we have uh, Robert Sloper, and he is a lighthouse. He likes to do a lot of lighthouse work. And then we have Jill Bowman, and she does like flowers and landscapes and stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, sounds great. And uh, people can't see it on the podcast here, but you have a picture up behind you on Zoom here that's, uh, I guess, one of your photos. And it looks like kind of clouds hanging over the mountains. Is that what I'm seeing here? Yeah, it's Yellowstone and steam oh, from, it's Yellowstone. From, one of the, from one of the geysers. And uh, yeah, uh -huh. it's part of my fine art black and white uh, Uncharted series. It's beautiful. I, I love you. black and white lands, landscape photography. So I, I look forward to seeing more of yours. So let's talk about what's happening at the, the gallery this month. Uh, there is a lighthouse theme for the month of July, uh, which we're in the middle of when people are going to be hearing this. What, what led you to do a lighthouse theme this month? Basically, June started out and I'm thinking all the people are coming to York for uh for the lighthouse and for tourist season, season. And I thought, you know, what a perfect opportunity to have it be a great stop on the tourist train to come by the gallery and buy a piece of art to, as a memento. And there's a lot of lighthouse photography featured, obviously. Uh, we have over 20 artists and they're amazing. They're, some of them are just, I'm like, I want to take them all home. I have no wall space. <laughs> uh huh. Uh huh. I'm sure a lot of lighthouse buffs will feel that when they go see it. And also on July 23rd, uh, you're uh, having children's activities. In the morning, we are having some crafts and we're having some lighthouse story time and some wildlife animals around lighthouses story time. And uh, it's going to be a lot of fun, big family event and just get a lot of people in there and have a good time. That sounds absolutely great. And also, I hear through the grapevine that you're having a special guest speaker as part yes. of this as well on that same day, the evening of July 23rd, Sunday, July 23rd. At six o'clock. Which, mm -hmm, which when people are hearing this, uh, this podcast episode is uh, going to be posted on July 16th. So it's a week from today when we're uh, uh, putting this uh, online. Six o'clock, July uh, 23rd, I will be speaking about lighthouses of New Hampshire, the New Hampshire coast and Southern Maine from uh, the Isles of Shoals, Portsmouth Harbor, up to the Nubble in York, Boone Island, which is offshore there, and Whaleback Lighthouse in Kittery. So it's a great group of lighthouses, and I look forward to speaking at your gallery about that. I'm just wondering, is this the first thing kind of like this that you've done at the gallery? Uh, this uh, is our third theme. We had theme, spring okay. in April, uh, May, and then we had, um, and we had maritime last month. Mm -hmm. But this is the first time I'm making it a little bit bigger of an event, you know, so we, we've been having like artists mingles, which any photographer is welcome to come to those. And then we've been having the artist receptions, but now I want to make it more of a fun time. And I, I actually asked one of the artists, I go, do you know any speakers that speak about lighthouses? And he's like, oh my gosh, I've got the perfect guy. You've got to reach out to this guy. I'd never heard of you before. So I was like excited to actually reach out. So, yeah, well, I'm glad it works out. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to it. And I'm in the process of framing a few of my photos for your gallery as well. Which I'm uh, thrilled about. Yeah, me too. Me too. After this month, after the lighthouse theme is, is all uh, finished for this month, will you continue to have some lighthouse photos in the gallery? There will always be lighthouse photos because Corey Kane is photographically obsessed with lighthouses. Uh, <laughs> and I has understand entire that. walls of that. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, he he'll always have lighthouses in the in the gallery, and so does Robert Sloper. Uh -huh. And uh, yeah, so you'll always be able to find some here. Yeah, I completely understand that obsession. Believe me, <laughs> <laughs> having been doing it for about forty years. And uh, again, let's let's just mention for people in the area, and I know there's quite a few listeners in New Hampshire and, and Maine, who would be within a fairly short drive uh, to York. Where exactly is the gallery? It's in uh, York Village. Is that Route 1A it's on? So the best thing to do would be to navigate to the York Public Library and park mm -hmm. there. And our building is right next to the York Public Library and just walk to the front of York Street and we're right there. 
Okay. Yeah. I know I've spoken at the library before too. Oh, cool. So I know yeah. it's very close. That's a good idea. Park in the library lot because street parking can be a little hard to come by there. And it's a free mun municipal uh, mm -hmm. lot. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you're across the street from Fat Tomato, right? Little uh, yeah. sandwich place that I, I like. I've been there before. And upstairs, actually, from the Sun Drop, which is an awesome little restaurant. And mm -hmm. there's a cute little boutique next door called Daisy Jane's, which is a really awesome little shop. So, yeah, I, York Village is a neat, neat place. Uh, and uh, what you're doing is a, a great addition, I think, for the community. So congratulations on, on all that and being involved with that. Okay. And if people want to find out more information and or the uh, the talk that I'm doing, there is a, an admission fee for that. And people need to to make a reservation in advance. Right. Correct. Um, limited seating. Yeah. Uh, you have a Facebook page, I believe. Is that right? Yep. So there's a Focus 244 Facebook page and then mm -hmm. they can also follow Corey Kane Photography and they mm -hmm. can follow me on any platform. Shannon K. Culpepper. And you'll okay. find all the events there. On the Facebook page for Focus 244, there's info about the Lighthouse Correct. Month and yep. on my talk as Correct. well. Yeah, and I'm trying to spread the word about my talk as well over social media and about the, the Lighthouse Month at the gallery. So Shannon, this is great. I, I'm, I had, I'm very happy we had this chance to talk today, and I really appreciate you inviting me to be part of uh, your Lighthouse uh, Month, Lighthouse-themed month at uh uh, Focus 244. So look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you so much, Shannon. Thank you so much. Have a great day. To learn more about the Focus 244 Gallery and the Lighthouse events this month, go to their Facebook page at facebook.com slash focus 244. I'm looking forward to speaking there on the 23rd and maybe meeting some of our listeners. I hope some people can make it. Let's introduce our second guest now. Sure. The waterfront of Belfast, Northern Ireland, is home to one of the world's biggest tourist attractions, Titanic Belfast, also known as the Titanic Museum. The museum opened in 2012 and attracted more than 6 million people in its first seven years of operation. In 2018, two important new attractions, the Great Light and the Titanic Walkway, officially opened to the public near the museum. The so-called Great Light is the world's first and largest hyperradial Fresnel lens. It was originally installed in Torrey Island Lighthouse in 1887, and it went through some unusual changes over the years. That's the subject of this interview. Maybe we should give a little background on Fresnel lenses. Yes, I think that's a great idea. The Fresnel lens was the brainchild of the French scientist Augustin Fresnel in the early 1820s. Fresnel lenses directed the light into a powerful horizontal beam and were designed in several different sizes or orders. Powerful first order lenses were meant for use in important coastal lighthouses. The sixth order lens was the smallest, designed for use in small harbors and ports. The lenses were eventually used in lighthouses worldwide. Hyperradial or hyperradiant lenses were the largest ever made. Beginning in the 1880s, only about 30 hyperradials went into service worldwide before the development of smaller and brighter lamps rendered the large optics unnecessary. In today's interview, we talked about how many hyperradial lenses are still in lighthouses. We aren't quite sure about it, uh, but the actual number is nine, uh, nine hyperradials still in lighthouses, and you can see a list on the U.S. Lighthouse Society website. Just go to uslhs.org, click on History, then click on Lighthouse Technology, then Fresnel Lenses, and then Hyperradial Lens Locations. That's kind of a lot to remember. Or you can just go to the uh, search box on the front page of the site, uslhs.org, and search for Hyperradial Lens Locations. Hyperradial, by the way, is H-Y-P-E-R dash radial. Dr. Sally Montgomery has been a science educator for more than 40 years. She is currently a board member of the Commissioners of Irish Lights, a board member of the Titanic Foundation, and a former trustee of the Maritime Belfast Trust. Sally has done much in-depth research on the history of the Great Light. I want to thank Tom Tang, the technical advisor for the U.S. Lighthouse Society, for telling me about this story and pointing me to Sally. I got to visit the Great Light in Belfast last year. I loved visiting Belfast and Titanic Belfast. The museum was incredible, and it was uh, a thrill seeing that Great Light as well. And it was fun learning the story behind it when I talked to Sally. So let's listen to my conversation with Sally Montgomery now. 
I'm speaking today with Sally Montgomery, and Sally is a, well, actually, she's one of the commissioners of Irish Lights. She's a former trustee of the Maritime Belfast Trust, and as she just informed me, she is a newly minted patron of the Association of Lighthouse Keepers. All of those things are very impressive. Thank you so much for being with me today, Sally. I really appreciate it. Pleasure. Pleasure. You have done a tremendous amount of research on the lens uh, known as the Great Light that is now on display in Belfast, Northern Ireland, and we're going to speak uh, about that today. But let me just start out by asking you a little bit about your background. How did you get involved in all the this uh, all these maritime associations and lighthouse associations and so forth? Well, I guess I started, I was the education officer and then head of education at the Ulster Museum. And I, I'm a daughter of an engineer, so I, li- I really like their moving engines that they had. But I was seconded to head up uh, the development of a new science centre in Belfast, uh, W5. In fact, the only science centre really on the island of Ireland. Um, and I became its chief executive in 2001. And in 2006, uh, Belfast City Council asked me whether I would do an exhibition on Titanic uh, every Easter, there is an ex- there was an exhibition in the City Hall, and the City Hall was being refurbished. So they asked me whether I would do an exhibition and host it in W5 uh, on their behalf. And as I was a member of National Museums, I had access to Robert Welsh's archives. And Robert Welsh was the official photographer of Harland and Wolfe from about um, 1890, and he was the most fantastic photographer. And he not only took the photograph of every ship that was launched, but he photographed their build, um, and he photographed their engine rooms and also their state rooms, et cetera, et cetera. And so I became somewhat obsessed (laughs) by the evolution of the design of ships. You could see it from, you know, things in these extremely luxurious, luxurious ships with grand fireplaces to, um, in fact, when Titanic was launched, they had the first modern electric radiators. So, I, you know, I, I could just see this evolution and we did this exhibition and because the photographs were so good, we could blow them up to enormous banners. And um, what was fascinating was we we got hold of, I got hold of the, the colour brochure for the Olympic line and, and Titanic, which is a coloured, it's a coloured brochure. But when you blew up some of the interiors of Titanic and Olympic, you could see that they'd been mopped up because the, the, the carpet hadn't been tacked down properly. So they clearly had quickly mopped up a room so it could be photographed. And the photograph was then used to produce these um, art line, um, beautiful colored uh, brochures, hmm. which, was, which was fascinating. So we did this exhibition in, in 2006. And then the following year, we did another one, but we added SS Nomadic. And Nomadic was the first class tender at Cherbourg that took passengers out from Cherbourg to the to Titanic. So I um, and W5 sits on Abercorn Basin, which is faces the the where um, the Olympic class ships were built. Um, so all around us, we were steeped in maritime history. And when I left uh, W5 in 2012. Um, I became a trustee of, of Maritime Belfast. So I was, you know, sucked in, mm-hmm. <laughs> definitely sucked <laughs> into to maritime history. Right. Well, as you're speaking, I was thinking about, you know, your study of ships, uh, I was thinking how ships uh, are, and, and lighthouses and lighthouse lenses are all kind of uh, measures of technology uh, in, in the world in, in many ways for a long time. So along with your study of ships, did that lead to your an interest in lighthouses and lighthouse lenses, or did that did it come a little bit later? Uh, well, I, I think it was it was possibly smoldering in the background because mm-hmm. I went to school in Kent um, in Broadstairs. I was asked recently whether it was near the lighthouse. My school was on North Foreland Road, and of course, the lighthouse was the North Foreland Lighthouse. So I was literally grew up next to the lighthouse. 
but we just took it for granted, except when the foghorn went. And <laughs> that certainly disturbed all of our lessons. But no, I really didn't get um, sucked into lighthouses until uh, Maritime Belfast received a letter. Uh, it was a letter which had been sent to Titanic Belfast. So in 2012, as part of the anniversary, the 100th anniversary of the launch of Titanic, a, a major museum um, visitor attraction was built called Titanic Belfast. Mm-hmm. And Maritime Belfast holds that in trust for the public So because it was built with public money. And Irish Lights had written to Titanic Belfast asking them whether they would consider housing a lens. Kerry Sweeney, who's the chief executive, showed me the letter. And when I read it, it rang... It rang a um, piece of memory in my head because more or less on the last week at W5, I received a phone call. And the phone call was, would W5 consider hosting or displaying this lens? And I remember asking what weight it was. And they said it was 10 tons. And this is metric tons, Mm. uh, not imperial tons. And I I knew that uh, our floor waiting was was about 7.5 so I could just see this lens <laughs> going straight through our floors so I said no but here was this letter again asking whether someone could look display this lens and Kerry gave it to me being the only scientist on the board said would you would you have a look into this and I think it took me about two weeks to come back and say there's something in this I <laughs> the letter said it was a first class first Mm -hmm. lens but when i read stuff about new island etc and 1887 it all didn't quite fit and i said it it just needs a bit more research yeah yeah well i want to i want to get more into that research for sure but let me just ask you for a definition here uh for people who might not know i i think most of our listeners know what fresnel lenses are basically uh such a, a you know, beautiful, functional, uh, I call them functional works of art, basically, uh, using lighthouses all over the world. But what is a hyperradial lens specifically? What makes them so special? Well, Fresnel um, classified his, his lenses into sizes, but the size was based on the focal length. Mm-hmm. So it's the distance from the lamp to the, to the lens. And um, the focal length of a first order lens, which most folk would know about is 920 millimeters. The focal length of a hyperradial is one meter, 330 millimeters. So it, it, it produces a much bigger light, much mm-hmm. bigger light. And it were, they were only, they were, I think um, Thomas Tagg, who helped me in this research enormously, they think there's only about 30 in the world. Very rare, only used for landfall lightha- lighthouses. Right. I, a place where if a ship was coming across the Atlantic, the Pacific, you know, the big seas, the big oceans, you were pretty desperate to see a light at the end of, <laughs> on, the, on the coast to know that you'd arrived in the right place. Yeah, it's my understanding there's just a, maybe two or three maybe you know the answer to this hyperradial lens is still in service in lighthouses i know there's one at cape race in newfoundland canada yeah and, and tory at, island tory island off tory Stonewall. island still has it. yeah okay and um makapu makapu i believe it's pronounced hawaii in hawaii yeah still yeah. has has one that might be about it uh yeah. there is a table there is a table mm-hmm. that will probably tell you Right. The U.S. Light, Lighthouse Society, of course, uh, Tom Tag being a big part of that. So I have to double check that. But uh, so uh, in reading your research on this lens, it's it's fascinating. It was kind of like a mystery story. <laughs> <laughs> trying to, trying to peer, peel away the layers of the onion of the, the lens's history. What made the history of this lens so intriguing and so kind of mysterious? Well, Irish Lights had said that on Mew Island's brass, the the lenses sit in a brass frame and on the brass frame, it was stamped Bombardier 1887. So Bombardier was the maker 
and the lens was therefore made in 1887. One of the former lighthouse keepers, a guy called Reggie Hamilton, had written up the, the history of Mew Island for its centenary in 1984. And he referred to the lens coming from Tory Island Lighthouse. And it, the, these two lighthouses seem to be mixed up and intermingled. And uh, initially, I thought they had taken the lens out of Tory Island and put it straight into Mew Island. But that, hadn't, that didn't make sense. So it was a question of, what was this lens? Was it a hyperradial? Because Reggie Hamilton and Irish Lights referred to it as a first order. Did it come from Tory? What, what on earth was going on? So it, it took a while to unpick. Yeah. For the uh, sake of our listeners and also to re remind me, can you just say basically geographically where Tory Island Lighthouse is and where Mew Island is? Okay. So there, there are actually three lighthouses worth talking about or three positions, and they're all landfall sites. So if you're coming from America, your landfall, well, you know, Canada, America, so north, uh, coming down the Atlantic, your first port of call, your first lighthouse is Tory Island, which sits off Donegal, which is the northwest coast. It's an island off the northwest coast of, of Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, if you were coming up from South America, your first lighthouse off the Irish coast is Bull Rock, which is off Cork. It's on Southwest Ireland. Mm -hmm. However, if you were coming from Scotland or Wales up the Irish Sea and you're coming to the port of Belfast, you come to a group of islands called the Copeland Islands. They're just off the northeast coast of County Down. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they sit just before Belfast Harbour. And that is where Mew Island Lighthouse is. So these, these three positions are absolutely key to the navigation and the safety of the mariner coming from long distances. Mm -hmm. yeah. And extremely important for trade um, because in the 18, uh, 1870s, 1880s, you're talking about the, the resurgence of linen across Ireland, but particularly Belfast. And Belfast was called Linenopolis because your civil war had blockaded the cotton being exported. So linen absolutely um, just exploded in popularity. And Belfast was literally built on linen because mm -hmm. all of our uh, Victorian buildings, our big, um, you know, the city hall, or all bought from the proceeds of selling linen. And this is why Belfast became the center of shipbuilding and also of rope making. It was the world center for, for rope making. Wow. Yeah, it's all it all fits together. Thanks for the, the overview there. It's really interesting. Uh, I, I was on the uh, US Lighthouse Society's Ireland tour last year, as I was telling you earlier. Saw Mew Island Lighthouse's little speck in the distance. That's as, as close as we got, but uh, did get to uh, Titanic, Belfast, and of course the the Great Light. Uh, and um, if we could go back and uh, if you could talk a bit more about uh, where your research led you, it kind of led me to a guy called John Richardson Wiggum, mm -hmm. and he was a Scot, came from Edinburgh to really Dublin. Um, it, to apprentice with his his brother brother in law, his brother in law was making gas um, gas lamps, gas domestic gas appliances for homes in the eighteen sixties. Um, and John came over when he was fifteen. Um, at the age of nineteen, Joshua, his brother in law, died, and John takes over. Uh, to look after his, his sister and, and her family. Um, but he was quite a remarkable man um, who was um, really obsessed with actually what you could do with gas uh, to make lights and domestic appliances. His cousin was on the time in shipbuilding and whether that influenced him or not, I don't know, but his 
his cousin's firm uh, later um, became, uh, through merger with Swan Hunter, the Tyne being near Newcastle, um, and they made the Mauritanian. So whether or not John was influenced by this shipbuilding element in his family, but he was a great inventor and he started to create uh, lights for the use in lighthouses. And in around 1863, he was given a small grant by Irish Lights to see whether he could create a light for a lighthouse. And his first pilot went into the Bailey Lighthouse, which is just off um, Dublin Port. Huge success because what he had created, it's often referred to as a crocus burner, but I think it more, looks more like an onion. It has these rings and in, in, in the rings, there are these holes where the jets of, of flame kept, comes out. And what he was able to do was to control the amount of light depending on the conditions at, at, at nighttime. So if it was a clear starry night with a full moon, you don't need much light. So he would reduce the number of rings that were lit um, and the number of jets. If it was a very dark, foggy night, you could increase and expand the number of jets and therefore increase the, the luminosity, the br brightness of the light. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, uh, the gas was coming from coal gas. So you burnt the gas and you distilled the gas off it. And it's not a very pleasant, nasty smelling um, gas, but used domestically in towns, certainly throughout Ireland. So uh, as it was a success, he saw the, the opportunity to, to use gas in lighthouses. But as his inventions got bigger and brighter, they started to crack the glass <laughs> because the heat was so intense. So his solution was essentially you move the glass, you move the lens away, therefore you need a bigger lens. So he was cracking first order lens lenses. So Thomas Stevenson in Scotland had started talking about a hyperradial lens in 1871. Mm -hmm. And he thought, well, this is a great idea. So he went to the Royal Society and said, guys, I want to make this big, big lens with with this focal length of 1.3 meters and my friend Bombardier in France will make the lens for me. And uh, I can put it, I can put it in New Island. And because um, he needed approval from the Board of Trade, because you have to remember that all the lighthouses in Scotland, England, Wales and Ireland are controlled from London. And at the time it was the Board of Trade, it's now the Department of Trade. Um, still, he didn't get permission. So sadly, New Island was built with a triform, so three layers of lenses, first order, first mm -hmm. order lens. Mm -hmm. So I read this, <laughs> okay, <laughs> where does this, hyperradial comes from because he's he's failed and he didn't give up he essentially saw an opportunity when there was um the great irish lights the great no it wasn't great irish lights it was the great lighthouse trials off the south foreland coast okay. which is again in kent near dover mm -hmm. So what they did was they wanted to find out which fuel gave the best light. So they tried coal gas, they tried uh, kerosene, et cetera, kerosene slash paraffin, um, to see which light gave the best light. And at the time he had got his, the French Bombardier, manufacturers to produce a lens so he could also demonstrate the availability of light from this lens and they did this in a quite a scientific way they did have a boat out at sea that was measuring 
And I believe it's about the first time they started using um, lumens as mm. a measurement of light. And out of that came it, well, yes, actually, John Richardson Wiggum, you're right, your, your lens and your light is pretty good. So he then got permission to use his gas burner and a hyperradio lens in Tory Island mm -hmm. in 1887. Okay. So here we have this Mark Bombardier, 1887, on the brass that went in. Uh, it was a triform, uh, again, uh, lens, three layers, mm -hmm. eight, 18 lenses, and it went into Tory Island in 1887. And um, I searched the newspaper archives and came up with both the description of New Island's 1884 light, lighting, litting, when the lighthouse is lit, and yeah. also the 1887 one. And what's fascinating is clearly John Wiggum had written essentially a press release because the accuracy of the quotations around what the lens was and what it would do and how many nautical miles it could shine for and how many what candle power it was it was all there mm -hmm. and I can't believe a journalist would have got that right without a crib sheet so it was fascinating to see in 1887 that they were writing press releases mm. um, but very dramatic uh, descriptions of being at sea seeing this this lighthouse being lit but the lens uh, was a Tory Island for, uh, remind me how many years, but then uh, was uh, altered. <laughs> to, well, mm -hmm. the question was, how did a hyperradial lens in Tory get into Mew? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Irish Lights, uh, Barry Phelan had very kindly given me as many design drawings as he possibly could. So we had the lantern drawings from you and the lantern drawings for Tori, and they are the most beautiful things. They really are beautifully engineered drawings. And also Irish Lights gave me access to their archive. And their archive is in uh, the Bailey Lighthouse, or was in the Bailey Lighthouse, um, looked after by uh, a former engineer, a, a guy called Frank Pelly. And Frank also looked after a number of artifacts. So he was able to explain to me and show me a crocus burner from John Richardson Wiggum. He showed me the lenses and I could go and look at all sorts of lenses um, and just a whole load of artifacts. It was, it was a fantastic visit. And then we went into the archive and Irish Light's archive has about 18 different collections. The minutes of the board start, I think, in the 1820s. And the engineers' minutes and notes go from about 1850. So going, to, going through them meticulously, it became clear that in the um, 1920s, they had asked the Chance Brothers to alter the light in uh, Tory, and they also had given the instructions to reduce the size of the lantern. So the lantern was tall, and I found a postcard of Tory Island. It's a very tall a lantern to hold these this triform um, lens. They were reducing it to hold a two-tier lens. So the Chance brothers were asked to reduce the lens to two-tier, and it would have four lenses per tier and two blanks. And the blanks, when rotate, would give the flash. So you would get four panels with the light and two blank panels, which would give the, the dark. So that okay. would give you your characteristic flash. They also asked the Chance Brothers to install a mercury bath. Mm -hmm. 
So the mercury bath was invented in 1890 to actually assist the, the weight, the mass of these very heavy lenses because mercury is so, it allows things to rotate almost frictionless. Mm -hmm. So that was perfect. Okay. <laughs> that was Tori. So Tori now had its hyper radial lens going from three to two, but that didn't answer the question from you. I did find a note in the engineer's book that said that in the 18, 1920s, Mew Island's lens had started to play up. I nicknamed it the disco light because it's clearly it was fluctuating in how many flashes it was giving, which is no good for a mariner if they're trying to work out where they are. So something was clearly wrong. The Chance Brothers, who are based in Birmingham, they set up in competition to the French to produce lenses. And they became really the go-to place in the UK for, for lenses, in the UK and Ireland. So I searched how I could contact someone in, in the Chance, because then they're not, they're not functioning anymore. They were absorbed into Pilkington Glass, a very famous glass manufacturer, and really stopped making lenses about 80 years ago. Um, they stopped making domestic glass, I think, in the 1960s. And I just Googled <laughs> and wrote and Googled and wrote. And I finally, by chance, discovered that oh, they, were, uh, they were digitizing the chance archives. and. Uh, so I approached them and said, you know, how far have you gone? And I did have to wait a time before they got to the years I wanted. But the first book for 1923, I could see the order from Irish Lights to the Chance Brothers for the manufacture or the conversion of Tory Island's triform to its biform in 1923. And then it went back and the installation of the uh, Mercury Bar. And then there's science. And I went to 1924 and couldn't find it. And eventually I was laid up just after Christmas with a really terrible stomach bug, feeling like hell. And I got an email from them with the latest sets of books. Uh -huh. And in the very last one, there was Mew Island and the order uh -huh. for Mew Island. And it said, essentially, repeat order, uh, Tory Island, um, except do not put in the three distancing bars on the frame. This is strange. So they had used the leftover lenses from Tory to make another, and the frame, another biform hyperradial from New Island that went back in 1928. Mm -hmm. I went back to the Bailey to look at the archives um, to just confirm the dates. And I said to Frank Pally, I said, you don't by any chance have the noticed mariners of when the light was first lit, relit. And he went, I don't think we started collecting notice to mariners until after that date. So I, you know, I said, fair enough. And I packed all my gear up and literally had just got it together. And he came rushing back in and said, look, look, look. And the very first page of the record was Mew Island. Uh, Notice to Mariners stating that the light would be, the main light would be relit on the 1st of September, uh, 1928. And that was really the, the last part of, the, of that sequence, that technology. Right. I was absolutely thrilled. Huh. Yeah. Coming back to these three distancing pieces, we have photographs taken in mm -hmm. the Chance Brothers factory mm -hmm. of what we thought was Tory Island light. It, it's, it's, the, it's just the, the new, newly constructed or reconstructed Biform lens sitting in their in their in their factory. We looked a lot closer, and we noticed that they actually were two different photographs. 
And the difference with these three distance plates just on the frame. So in fact, we had one photograph of Tory lens in their factory and one photograph of Mew lens in their factory. Okay. And that was that was fantastic. Of course, we had all the drawings from our slides. It all seems really unusual to me. I, I don't remember ever hearing of another case of a, a large lens like that kind of being divided up <laughs> into, into two lenses. Have you heard of other cases, anything like that? No, and I, I just wonder whether it's post-war efficiency mm. because Maybe. lenses were changed um, as, as lenses improved and as technology changes, there have been an awful lot of changes in, in the lantern. Uh, and I said, well, where, where do these old lenses go? And <laughs> the answer was they opened the window and threw them out. Um, in many cases, yes, I know they did, yeah, sadly. Uh, it is sad, but I think in this case, I'm sure it was some efficiency that that because mm -hmm. there wasn't a lot of money around. Um, yeah, and they got two lights, two lights out of out of one. Speaking of changing lens technology, you you mentioned the fact that a lot of these rotating lenses rotated on beds of mercury, which was a, a great bearing, as you said, uh, created a frictionless uh, rotation. Are, in this country, in the U.S., uh, to my best of my knowledge, there's only one lens that still rotates on Mercury. That's it. Uh, it's a third order lens that split rock light in Minnesota, but it's no longer active. They just use it for ceremonial purposes now and then, but the Mercury is still in there. Are there lenses in Ireland that still have their Mercury? And if so, is that, uh, are they being phased out? What's happening with that? There are lenses that still have Mercury. There are our sites have taken the view that when they do engineering works um, on a lens or an, on a light, they will take out the mercury. The reason Mew Island became the great light is in 2012, Irish lights, Irish lights have got this program of works of solarization where they put solar panels on the balcony of the lighthouses and batteries inside, mm -hmm. um, which then operates an LED light. Um, this is all part of decarbonizing the asset, our assets. They didn't have a solution in 2012 for Mew Island. So the lens was very, very carefully taken out of the tower, winced down the tower and cratered and sat in crates at the bottom of the tower from 2012. Mm -hmm. And it just has a uh, LED light in it. Mm -hmm. How, however, and coming full circles, this is why they, they took out the mercury and they couldn't, couldn't carry the weight of a heavy lens without some sort of bearing. Mm -hmm. so, that, so the lens came out. And this is why they wrote to try and see whether someone would display this this lens and i think my heart was in my mouth when i realized how vulnerable it was sitting at the base of the tower on an island right with, with the irish sea on its doorstep um, uh, and quite remarkably once maritime belfast agreed to find a home for it and they they ran a, a design competition to find a suitable housing mm -hmm. with with a bearing that would help with its rotation. Irish lights then had to literally float the crates out using a motorboat to the Gronje Whale, which is Irish lights ship. And they mm. filmed this plus a helicopter to take the lighter parts. Wow. And it's a scary, really, it was a really scary operation, but we didn't lose, we didn't lose anything. Mm -hmm. um, it was really technical to bring the lens all the way into Belfast Lock to its home and sit it in its nice glass surround where it, where it can be now viewed. But mm -hmm. coming back to your point, I think that work really initiated, they had already started talking about how do we avoid the necessity to take out these heritage lenses? 
Now, what can we do to keep these heritage lenses in place, but take out the mercury? So they started on really the most important site, which is, of course, Tory. And I, I missed a wee bit out of the research because it was quite clear that Tory Island was the first lighthouse in the world to have a hyperradial lens in 1887. Two months later, the Chance brothers installed a hyperradial lens in Bishop Rock off the coast of Cornwall. So it was the first by two months. Hmm. So it's an important, it's a, an important site, an important lens. So they um, work tirelessly to produce a solution. And they now, uh, about a year and a half ago, really succeeded in creating this, uh, this platform with a bearing which allows the heritage lens to stay in situ and rotate and keep the character of the light. Mm -hmm. um, it took them much longer and a lot more money than they had hoped for, but now they have a solution which they can apply to other heritage lenses, uh, which, is, which is important. Um, mm. So it's been quite an investment. But yes, Mercury is bit by bit coming out of all of the lighthouses. Right. There are a fair few to go. I think we have 64 operational lighthouses around the coast. Uh, I know you uh, obviously looked at a lot of sources, talked to a lot of people in the course of your research. I know one of those people was Tom Tag, our uh, kind of uh, technological guru with the, uh, the U.S. Lighthouse Society. When I have any questions about the history of lens or lenses or lighting apparatus or anything in that neighborhood, I, I go to Tom all the time. <laughs> So uh, he he must have loved uh, kind of helping with this and and uh, finding out about this this whole whole history. It's well, the kind of thing he would he would eat up. I think he he was absolutely fantastic. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, first of all, a big shout out to his his website um, and his technical pages because there's so much information on it that it really it gives you the sort of baseline of what happened when and what is what and mm -hmm. it explains it so so brilliantly um but he himself it, it was just a wonderful person to write an email to and say i've got this far um what is this yeah yeah I, <laughs> help <laughs> i know how that works believe me yeah and, and he very kindly read my final sort of technical solution to it just to make sure i'd I'd got it right. Um, mm -hmm. So he was absolutely invaluable. Big shout he out is. to him. He is invaluable. A shout out exactly to Tom because he suggested that I contact you to be on the podcast. So oh, thanks wow. to Tom <laughs> for that as well. So um, you've uh, talked about the uh, design for the display and everything. And it's, I believe, is it officially part of what's considered the Titanic walkway? Is that, do I have that right? Well, it, timing is everything. It, it, you're quite right. It's part of the Titanic walkway. And the, we were extremely lucky that Maritime Belfast works in partnership with the harbour and with the operator of Titanic Belfast. And they were installing this walkway where, so you can walk from Titanic Belfast along the coast, along the um, Belfast Lock, Belfast Harbour to HMS Caroline. And HMS Caroline is the only surviving destroyer from the Battle of Jutland in mm -hmm. the First World War. And it's a lovely, it's a lovely walk. And halfway along that walk, the lens uh, is, is situated in its glass housing. Yeah, we did our group, uh, U.S. Lighthouse Society group there last year, did see all that. And it's a great, I mean, what a fantastic site. Of course, uh, Titanic Belfast is uh, one of the biggest tourist attractions in the world, right? It's a, Yes, uh, mm -hmm. it's won best tourist attraction two years in a row. In the I world. Think. In right. the world, yes. It's absolutely it, incredible. It was crowded the day we were there, um, but and I imagine it's crowded almost all the time, but it's, it's of course, well worth, worth visiting. Uh, and for lighthouse buffs, this gives them another reason to to go there. Of course, yeah, they've just um, redone their last three galleries, mm -hmm. and they have a most wonderful immersive experience at the end, which is called kind of the ship of dreams, where you see these um, 
young people and hear these the stories of these couples that go on wanted to go on a ship for a new life in America and then you see a, a very gentle de- scene around the sinking and it's just a really lovely ending it's very mm. very moving yeah. um, so the, this part is really really new that you're talking about it's right? really uh, new yeah yeah i don't think it was there open when when i was there last year yeah, yeah. no it's refreshed uh-huh yeah oh fantastic i hope to get back sometime let me ask you uh has this project researching the history of the so-called great light has it made you into even more of a aficionado of lighthouses do you think well uh, yeah i mean it um it made me apply to become a commissioner of irish lights because mm-hmm. i'd spent so much time talking to barry Phelan and um, frank pelly and they were all super helpful and i realized there's just so many stories and every lighthouse is different and um, some people think that they are redundant. No way are they redundant. Right. For one thing, it's very difficult to hack a lighthouse. Um, you can. <laughs> That's a good a, point. Well, you know, yeah. they're there. They're physical structures. And I think they're extremely important. Mm-hmm. I agree. I agree completely. So I have one final question for you. Okay. And this one's for bonus points. <laughs> so get your thinking cap on. Uh, what uh, was your favorite part of your research on the the lens known as the great light? Oh, I think I have two parts. One, seeing the order books, the Chance Brothers order books, and two, the notice to mariners, because they were just like the icing and the candle on top of the cake. But I, I, I also think I probably should add talking to some of the former lighthouse keepers bill power was on new island for 14 years which is unusual because through the rotation of lighthouse keepers you're not really supposed to have that length but he was a member of the union and they needed to be he needed to be at a lighthouse that they could call him to shore and for him to be in Belfast or dublin for a meeting mm-hmm. so so he got stationed on Mew Island and his son also joins as a lighthouse keeper. They started to withdraw lighthouse keepers before he became a principal keeper, but I got him to interview his father and it's the most touching um, interview. Bill was so knowledgeable and so very generous in his knowledge and sharing his stories. And uh, hearing someone talk about the light that you've been researching uh, just brings it to life. And I think the story that probably sticks in my head, and we have to remember how things have changed so much, but uh, he said that they would often light the lighthouse early in the winter because of the smog, the fog that would roll from down from Belfast um, out of the lock and then down towards Copeland Islands. And I looked at him and went, you know, was the fog really regular? And he said, no, Um, when everybody lit their coal fires, there was so much smoke in the air that it just, depending on the wind, and the wind usually was northwesterly, it would just blow the smoke towards the lighthouse. And Mm -hmm. we just, we don't have, we don't have that anymore because n- nobody burns coal. Right. So, so, well, n- not very much, certainly in, in cities. So he could tell about the real, the changes, you know, you didn't have a fridge for years and years and years. So you used to bury your, your, your butters and stuff in the ground to keep it cool. And how they first got a radio, uh, thanks to Cyril Lord. And Cyril Lord was a famous character who made carpets but uh, donated radios to lighthouse keepers mm-hmm. and and the library that that they had and uh, the stories about who could cook and who couldn't so mm-hmm. reggie hamilton who had written this story about new light new uh, lighthouse um he said reggie burnt every every meal that he ever 
<laughs> so so I, mean, I think it's, you know, the stories that bring, bring things to life. They're not bricks, of, just bricks of mortar. But... Yeah. Well, I think uh, that applies to obviously to, to lighthouses in general, to the lighthouses and, and lenses are absolutely fascinating. But yeah, the people, people are what bring it to life. Some of the best conversations I've had uh, with lighthouse keepers have been with Irish lighthouse keepers, including uh, Gerald Butler and Richard Cummins. I don't know if you know Richard yes. as well. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, it's been a real pleasure talking with them. And Sally Montgomery, it's been a real, real pleasure talking with you today. This is such a fascinating story, and I admire your tenacity and your research, your perseverance to get to the, the bottom of all this. Well, and now you're bringing this all to life for me, you know, having been there last year and seeing the, the lens on display and everything, but now it means a lot more to me. So I'm getting the, uh, the history and the kind of the human story behind yeah. it. I'd like to add one mm -hmm. one thing. Um, sure. My brother lives in Oregon, mm -hmm. and my niece uh, got married in Bend, in Oregon, and we took a holiday, uh, and we drove south from Bend, did Mount Rainier and places, and we hit the coast. And of course, I wanted to see the three lighthouses on along that coast up to Lincoln City. And we went to Hiseta. Do I pronounce that right? They pronounce it Hiseta. Hiseta Head. Yeah. Hiseta Head. And what a wonderful lighthouse. And of course, I was even more delighted when I discovered that the lens was made by the Chance Brothers. First order Chance Brothers lens. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That Hasita Head lens is a prime example of a beautiful Chance yeah. Brothers lens. And, and it was such an amazing day because it was slightly misty. Mm -hmm. And so the lens was working and you can climb up behind it. And just a really lovely, lovely, uh, yeah. lovely day. Oh, the Oregon coast is phenomenal. Anyway, I think it, I don't know if there's a, the Irish coast is as beautiful as any I've seen, but Oregon's right up there as, as well. Well, I was impressed mm -hmm. by it. The, the amount, the amount of logs and and trunks along the beaches was something mm -hmm. I've never seen, obviously before. But mm. yeah, it's very different from an Irish coast. Yeah. Well, again, thank you so much, Sally, for spending this time with me today. Uh, it's uh, again, it's all fascinating. And I, I know especially the uh, the lens and optics junkies among our listeners. And I know there's a lot of them. They're going <laughs> to love, love listening to this. Uh, so thank you, Sally. I really appreciate it. Well, Jeremy, I really enjoyed it, too. Thank you very much. You can read all about the history of the Great Light at greatlighttq.org. Thanks again to Sally Montgomery and to Shannon Culpepper for today's interviews. I just quickly want to mention one more thing. The U.S. Lighthouse Society is having a National Lighthouse Day dance contest, and August 14th is the deadline for submitting videos. Of course, August 7th is actually National Lighthouse Day. If you go to the front page of the Society's website at uslhs.org and look at what's new, you'll see info on the event. If you have any questions at all, please email me at jeremy at uslhs.org, J-E-R-E-M-Y at uslhs.org. I hope lots of our listeners will be represented in this contest. I look forward to seeing the uh, submissions. There will be several cash prizes, by the way. I'm looking forward to seeing all those dance videos. It's a fun way to celebrate National Lighthouse Day and also a fun way to bring lighthouse groups together. Yep, that's uh, certainly my hope, my thoughts exactly. We'll be back next week with a look at a lighthouse in South Africa that's also a hotel and restaurant. Until then, to all our regular listeners and our new ones, thanks so much for listening and keep a good light. Let it shine, let it shine.